The presentation I'm going to do right now was actually, uh, this was something <coughs> I did uh, at, a, at a little research conference, so some of the wording you see will be based on that. Um, so this project is, is headed up by uh, Dr. Lely Van and I. I'm not sure if she'll be in here with us. Um, she's really busy and we're in three high schools right now. Um, so actually today there's two other groups of students just like me and Max, who one is at Mission Vista High, and then, uh, is that your rival? Uh, and then also, also kind of West, Westview High School. Um, you, you might meet her, you might not. Um, and then I'm James, like I said. Another person is Alex. He's helped on this a lot. And we also have a group of awesome volunteers like Max. So a few organizations that I just want to point out. EERI is the Earthquake Engineering Research Institute. Um, they do a lot of stuff that has to do with earthquakes and buildings. Everything from the science of earthquakes in the ground to how structures respond and even the type of policies and procedures that get put in place um, for after disaster strikes, so they're really involved in that. And um, so that's our parent organization here for this project. Um, FEMA is involved as well. You guys might, you guys know what FEMA is? The Federal Emergen Emergency Management Agency. So they're the ones that uh, have to deal with the problems like Hurricane Katrina and how you're going to get water to people if there's in stuff like that. So some of our funding comes uh, through FEMA and then of course um, UC San Diego. So, so here's the problem uh, with schools specifically. So in 1996, this, uh, the National Center for Education <coughs> reported that the average age of a school building in the western U.S. was 39 years. That was 20 years ago. So, uh, give or take what we are now, it's safe to say that the average school building is on the wrong side of its midlife crisis. Uh, in over 100 years of recruiting earthquakes, California has never experienced an earthquake of magnitude 6.0 or greater during school hours. So, if you, there's actually, you can look at these charts online, um, and you can see when all these big earthquakes happen during California, and you begin to see that we've been pretty lucky. A big one was uh, Loma Prieta in 1989. Uh, that earthquake happened, Loma Prieta near uh, San Francisco, that earthquake happened during the World Series and the two teams playing in the World Series um, were the Oakland A's and the San Francisco Giants, which is kind of a cool thing that they're right next to each other. And it happened during, while the World Series was being played, so, uh, so everybody was at home watching it, nobody was out on the road and stuff, but there was damage that happened to freeways and things, but we got kind of lucky because of that, you know, like, crazy situation. Um, again, in uh, 1994 was, um, was the Northridge earthquake, um, that's a little more close to LA, that happened before rush hour. Um, so the point is that we've had earthquakes in California, big earthquakes, and we have, uh, you guys have probably done like duck and cover and hole drills, you guys have probably done those sort of things. <coughs> um, but it's never, we've never had a major earthquake happen during school hours, so it's hard to know if all those policies and procedures uh, are going to work. Um, that's part of the reason over here. Another thing is uh, roughly 20% of the classrooms in San Diego County are so-called uh, modular or relocatable classrooms. Do you guys have any of those here? Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah right? So a lot of them. I know there, 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 was, there was one person, um, there was one teacher that was interviewed uh, and she's been, she's been a teacher for like 20 years at Scripps Ranch High School and uh, she's been in, a, in one of those portable high schools her entire like 20 year career. Um, and those things, there's obviously questions about in an earthquake, would this, those things perform well compared to like a normal building like we're in right now, right? It's hard, it's hard to know how those things would behave. Um, and finally, schools are often used as emergency shelters, um, but in, in the, under building codes, they're not always listed that way. And when shelters uh, under building codes, if it falls in that category, there's uh, certain building codes um, that have to be put in place. So it's kind of like, okay, you know, do you guys, you guys remember the fires back in like 03 or 07? Um, did you guys have, did you guys, uh, remember on seeing on the news, there's probably like uh, emergency stations set up at schools and stuff like that? So during emergencies, schools are often used as important places, um, but they're not necessarily listed that way in building codes. So these are some of the thoughts that, that have gone into this project, why, why I'm doing what I'm doing, why UCSD is doing what it's doing to kind of build the awareness of that. Um, and there's a lot of different um, sides to that that we'll get into right now. Um, so just a brief overview. SESI is an EERI sponsored project to promote appropriate actions that create a safer environment worldwide for people that inhabit school buildings. 
It is a collaborative project consisting of diverse, expert, and passionate professionals who are committed to creating and sharing knowledge and tools that enable progressive, informed decision-making around earthquake and safety. So there's five sides to this. There's uh, an effort trying to update building codes. Um, there's safety advocacy. There's safety school screening, so people that want to come in and screen buildings and see if they're safe and if they need to be updated. There's a group um, more so in the, in the northwest uh, of the United States focusing on tsunami mitigation. And there's finally us. Uh, so I saw that face, right? Tsunamis over here. Uh, actually, recently it was discovered that there's a fault called the Cascadia Fault that uh, definitely could cause a major tsunami in the northwest side of the United States. Um, so that's an issue as well. And finally, classroom outreach. That's what we're here doing. So if changes were to take place uh, in classrooms, then they have to start in classrooms. So that's why I'm here doing this. Um, and you know, if your parents were going to hear things uh, politically about uh, if they wanted to pass some measure to increase safety, it helps if the conversation's begun in the classroom itself. That's our side of things. Um, I'll skip that. So this is the, the base of what you guys are going to be doing. We're going to be doing a design competition. Um, there's a basic structure that you see on your left. Then you guys are going to be in teams and groups. You'll retrofit that structure. You'll learn that what that word means if you don't already. Uh, and then we test it on a shake table. So this is a mechanical shake table that goes back and forth to simulate an earthquake. We put a weight on top. There's also a, uh, a blue accelerometer. You can't really see it in this picture very well. We attach an accelerometer on top of the structure and measure the acceleration. Um, and then you're scored on this what's called the performance index. So here, uh, N is the number of earthquakes you survive, a maximum of three. Uh, this is the weight of your structure and this is the cost. And whatever team gets the highest score at the end wins, and there'll be a prize. So that's that's the uh, that's the concept of what we're going to be doing here. Uh, I'll skip that as well. There's there's four different visits. Um, so we're gonna we're visit one today. So I'm going to tell you a little bit more about this stuff. Uh, the second visit will go a little deeper into structural systems, and we'll do some demonstrations. And uh, visit three, we'll get a little mathematical and talk about the different mathematics that structural engineers use to predict the performance of structures during earthquakes. And finally, visit four is when you guys are going to actually test your structures on the shake table. So you see a, different, a couple different uh, versions of structures that students have built. So this was from a pilot at Westview High School, a bunch of different, uh, bunch of different examples of um, things that students made. You guys are always creative. We're always impressed with you guys' level of creativity. Um, and especially in the names, like pineapples and yellow scales, salt and paper, yeah. Um, and that's that. So, so with that being said, we'll get into the actual presentation here. Let's begin. Lecture one. Again, UC San Diego, FEMA, EERI. You guys should know those names because they put a lot of effort into making this happen. So it's important that, that we give them credit. So today's schedule, we're going to talk about earthquakes, we're going to talk about causes, effects, and earthquake safety, then we'll get into a little bit more about structural engineering, we'll talk about introduction, we'll talk about a concept called capacity and demand, uh, and then we'll review and preview uh, for next week. So okay, plate tectonics. Tectonic forces are forces that move large sections of the continents. You guys have probably heard about this before in like your geology class or something like that. Um, shouldn't be anything new. There's, there's these giant plates um, in the earth that move around, and uh, when we study them, we call it plate tectonics. Um, tectonic forces create fault lines in different varieties. So there's things called subduction faults tra and transform faults. Uh, they get a little more complicated from there, but those are some two. Oh, by the way, uh, take notes. Um, take notes. You got your. Yeah. <laughs> I saw a couple notepads and that reminded me. So subduction, subduction faults and transform faults. So subduction fault is uh, in one in which one plate is going underneath the other. And a transform fault is when they slide against each other. So subduction faults are really common out in the ocean, and those are the ones that cause tsunamis. Uh, transform faults 
are the ones. Uh, so, so this is uh, the San Andreas Fault. You guys have all heard of that, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. The San Andreas Fault. Did anybody see that movie? Yeah. yeah. I didn't see it. I heard it was terrible. If you, you don't even have to be a structural engineer to realize that it's fake. But, but um, so the San Andreas Fault is a transform fault. So it's one slot, one side slides against the other. Um, another one that you guys might not know about, but that, this is a major fault in San Diego, is the Rose Canyon Fault. <coughs> the what? What about the fault? <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. <laughs> so, if you guys don't ask, you, when you guys get uh, when you guys get home tonight and you're talking to your parents like you always do, um, and they say, "What did you learn in school today?" Ask them if they know what the major fault line in San Diego is. They might even say San Andreas because that's what everyone knows. Um, but the correct answer is your Rose Canyon Fault. Um, it's not really known about because of how well known the San Andreas Fault is. Um, but it's, it is important, and there's actually some efforts going on to study it in greater detail and understand what type of earthquake it could cause should it, uh, well, the word I'm about to tell you. When these plates press against one another, pressure builds until fault rupture. So that's what happens. Um, when you have these, you have these tectonic forces are building up, and they're 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 pushing against each other, but nothing's moving. And once that force reaches a certain level, uh, the plates will move. Um, when that happens, uh, energy is released. A lot of energy is released in the form of uh, seismic waves. So um, a few different words here: seismic waves. Uh, we'll talk about that more in a second. Um, the epicenter. <coughs> you guys have heard that word. Uh, and there's also something called the focus. So the focus of the earthquake is actually where, where the rupture happens. The epicenter is the place on the surface of the earth that is above that. Um, so the earthquake, when you hear the epicenter is in uh, downtown Los Angeles or something like that, uh, the, on top that's where it happened, but really happened uh, beneath. Um, so when that happens, energy is released in the form of seismic waves. There's a few different types we'll talk about. So there's a P wave. There's an S wave, there's a love wave, and there's a really wave. So the, so the P and S waves are, are called body waves because they, they go through the body of the Earth. Um, they kind of start at the focus and then they, they kind of go toward the surface of the Earth, but not perfectly straight, they kind of curve a little bit. Um, and, the, uh, and the love and really waves are surface waves, so they only travel along the surface. And they, they go at different speeds, um, and because of that, you can that's how you track where the epicenter is. So we're using something called triangulation. We won't talk about it a lot, but the idea is that this P wave comes, it gets the P wave uh, gets there, and then later the S wave uh, gets there, and someone's recording this. Um, and if you have three locations recording those waves, then based on the different amount of time it takes for each one to get there, you can find out uh, where the earthquake is starting. Um, so here's a video of what the, the propagation looks like for a P wave. I think I have to click on it. What kind of wave is that, guys? Longitudinal. By the way, I just want to say props for being in an AP classroom. I was a total slacker in high school. All right. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that's it's good. To so uh, there's apparently some inside joke about the word slacker. Learning new things about you guys all the time. S waves look like this. What? <laughs> Kind of weak is that, guys? Oh, <laughs> so, uh, S waves, S waves cause the most damage. S waves um, are, are, are what cause a lot of the damage. Um, what do you think moves faster, the P wave or the S wave? Probably the P wave. Yeah, the P wave, right? Think about like if I'm walking <coughs> as opposed to like this. Like, if I were to just walk straight, I'll probably walk faster. Um, 
<laughs> but but the S wave ca uh, causes more damage. But they, they go at, they go at different speeds, and like I said, because of that, uh, you can gain information about where they came from. And actually, um, have you guys ever heard of like the like uh, early warning detection system? Yeah. Or something like that. People are trying to work on ways to warn people about when earthquakes are, are happening. Um, so the way that, that what they're trying to do is they're trying to study the P wave and see if the P wave can tell us anything about what is coming next when the S wave comes. So there's a little bit of a time differential there between when the S wave, uh, the P wave comes first, right? So the idea is, okay, the P wave gets to some center. The center, the center measures this P wave really quickly in some computer. And if it, if it looks like the S wave is going to be really big, then it can send out a detection to all our cell phones, just like we get amber alerts and uh, flood warnings you know, on, our, on our cell phones that there's gonna be an earthquake. That's the idea. The difficulty is, uh, the, the, like I said, the damage normally comes from the S wave, but people are trying to study if there's anything we can learn from the P wave that could help us because it's faster than we could actually get the early morning detection. So that's, um, that's kind of, just a little bit about, about P waves and S waves, and yeah, the P waves move faster. Here's an animation about what it looks like when earthquakes happen. Oh, it's a link. It's going to open in a. It's probably open in YouTube somewhere. Let's look at some effects. So this is an uh, this is a hospital um, after an earthquake that happened in 1971 in San Fernando, magnitude 6.4. The reason I put this picture up here is hospitals are a specific area of concern uh, during earthquakes. The reason being, after an earthquake strikes, hospitals don't need to only be standing up, but they also have to be uh, operational. Right? You can't just tell people in their hospital beds to get up and go home after an earthquake. Right? They have uh, so so hospitals are, uh, are are very they're in that category that's like really important when we design them because uh, not only should they not do this, but you know if this were to happen, everyone has to be evacuated. You're talking about people that you know are dealing with serious illnesses. You know uh, people that are about to go into surgery, just got out of surgery. They're laying in these beds, right? Like. 
uh, you know, you can't just tell them to up and leave. So hospitals are a specific area of concern for structural engineers. Um, here's another thing. These are some water lines crossing, crossing a fault during that same earthquake. Uh, when we think of earthquakes, we might think of just like buildings falling down and stuff, right? But um, other infrastructure is really important. Um, it, it doesn't do any good if the whole town has buildings standing up, but no water can get there, right? So uh, th these, are, these are lines that are broken, broken during an earthquake, so another area of concern. Um, here's that earthquake I mentioned during the World Series, 1989, 6.9. A lot of freeway damage happened. Uh, in, in this earthquake, um, and, and like I said, we were re we were really lucky because nobody was on the road because it was it was during rush hour, but everybody was watching the World Series, so um, we got really lucky. And uh, then, and uh, there's also something called soft story failure that was really common in this. We might talk about that a little more. Here's 1994 Nor Northridge earthquake. Uh, not good, right? Really bad. Also not good. Looks like something you'd see in a video game, like. Not good. All right, so here's, uh, now we're going to international. This is Kobe, Japan, 1995. I hear about earthquakes like every other week in Japan, right? Um, they've got a lot of issues over there. Um, so what they did here is they, they figured that if they just made these columns like really, 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 really big, then nothing bad would happen. But uh, as, as time has progressed and structural engineers have learned, that just bigger doesn't necessarily mean better during during an earthquake. You kind of there's this this balance between like stiffness and flexibility that you want to have. So you, things have to have a certain amount of stiffness, but they also have to be able to bend just a little bit the right ways during an earthquake. So Japan learned that the hard way here. Um, uh, happy to be on this side of the road that day. Not so good to be on that side. Um, here's something. So anyone know what this is called? Quicksand? Quick <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Road? Um, it's called liquefaction. So if the soil under, underneath is, uh, is saturated enough, then when it's shaken by the earthquake, um, the, the sat, this, uh, because of the saturation levels, the water will come up. Pressure builds. Uh, pressure builds because of the shaking, and then uh, uh, the water the water goes up because of that pressure, like the, the, the grains are sort of like pushing on the water and the water doesn't know where to go, so it goes up and, and, and liquefies the soil. And that's what that happened here. Um, uh, New Zealand is uh, kind of like Japan, right? It's an island and there's a fault line that goes like right across and so they have high saturation levels, so liquefaction is a big problem. So it's not all just buildings, right? Um, it, the, these are the types of things that we think about as structural engineer is, is uh, the very specific things that could happen uh, during earthquakes um, and what we specifically want to be concerned about. So those are causes and, causes and effects of earthquakes. Let's talk about some earthquake safety. So here's some things that you guys should do. Uh, you guys want to make sure that heavy items are secured. Um, these are straps that tie your TV or, or, your, uh, or your dresser back. Um, a lot of damage that could happen to a person isn't necessarily the building falling down, but it's other things around you that could fall on top of you during an earthquake. So uh, it's recommended that heavy items are secured. Um, and it's good to have, a, have an emergency plan. Um, if you're at school, follow the directions um, uh, of your teacher and the duct cover and all those things you've heard about before. But like I said before, it's hard to know if all those things are going to work out exactly as we want them to because we actually haven't had an earthquake happen, in, a big earthquake happen when everybody was in school. Um, so it's also good to have an emergency plan uh, with your family, and especially if you're not in school, right? Um, other things that you can do during an earthquake, like I said, drop cover and hold on. Usually, if you're, art, if you're outside, obviously you don't want to run back inside for duck cover and hold. Uh, <laughs> you laugh. And it is kind of funny, but, but to tell you a serious story, do you guys remember here about uh, the, the Nepal earthquake that happened like last year? So people had come to Nepal and told them things similar that I was telling you. Maybe it was the language barrier, maybe the people just didn't teach the right way, but there's a lot of, a lot of children who during that earthquake, because they were taught, taught to hide under a desk during an earthquake, they actually ran back into buildings during the earthquake and ended up dying because those buildings fell down. Um, and, and, and even adults 
uh, follow the students because the students have learned about this in their schools. So, the, or because like they're your kid, they're running the building, you're going to follow after them, right? So, uh, and and uh, and they died because of that. So, so drop, cover, and hold is the right idea to do if your building's not definitely going to fall down uh, and you're already in the building. Um, that's the right idea. Uh, so yeah, you want to get under the desk, something strong, sturdy like the desk, cover your neck and your head. Uh, stay in a position where you can get up if you need to. Um, if you can't get under your desk, you want to stay still. You don't, don't try to run for the door right away. People say go into the doorway. That's false. Like, you may have heard like the doorway is the strongest place. It's, it's a myth. It, that's not even true. Um, so you want to stay still. If, even if, if you try to run during an earthquake, you're likely to fall and then something else could fall on top of you. So staying still is important. If you are trapped, uh, if something does fall on you, something big, something heavy falls on, falls on you, it's not recommended that you try to get out on your own. Um, because you could make something worse. You could push something onto some other part of your body, get more stuck. You could push it onto somebody else. It's recommended that if you have a cell phone, you try to call. If not, uh, you call for help vocally, right? And wait um, to, to, for someone else to, to try to help you. Uh, those are things you definitely want to remember during and after an earthquake. Um, so, that, those are earthquakes. We're going to transition now to talk about structural engineering and how it relates to all that. So, what is a structure? I like to say that a structure is an object made up of one or more components that sustains forces and serves a function. Right? So everything on here is made up of one or more component. It sustains forces and it serves a function. Um, do you have anyone remember? Uh, can anyone guess why I have this Batman mask on here? Do you guys remember Batman Begins? Remember when they order all the masks yeah. Yeah. and uh, and like it breaks? Yeah. Yeah. It, uh, there was that. I think it was like in the second movie, but the first one, I think like Alfred like hits it with a hammer or something, and it just like shatters right away. Yeah. It didn't have the right material properties, um, right? So so some structural engineer needs to design that that mask um, or Alfred. Uh, everything on here, one or more components, the same forces serves a function. That is the structure. What does a structural engineer do? Okay, so here's a little schematic that just talks to you, that that is supposed to describe the the business of construction and how structural engineers relate to that specifically, mainly here for buildings. So this is uh, the Burj Khalifa. I think it might have been renamed Burj uh, Dubai or something like that. Um, it might still be the tallest building in the world anyway. You guys probably heard of it. All right, so you have an owner or a developer. Okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Totally mission impossible. So, owner of the developer has money, he wants to build something, okay? At the top, you've got an architect, he's got the vision of, of uh, what he or she wants the building to, to look like, um, and you've got the construction company who are bringing the materials and actually putting the things together, okay? Um, then you've got a lot of engineers, um, and actually a lot of times the engineers are working underneath the architect. Um, so, but th that's just how the business works, um, you guys don't really need to know that. Um, and there's a lot of different engineers. There's structural, civil, mechanical, electrical, other, that all go into a project like this. So this is where the structural engineers fit in. Uh, when, we, when structural engineers think of a building, then we don't really think of this. We think of this. We think of the, the parts that are structural that we can, uh, that are supporting the loads of the building. Um, what's, it, what's it made out of? Concrete, steel, wood? What's the structural system? How does it work? How are we going to make sure that it stands up? How are we going to make sure that it stands up during an earthquake? That's what the structural engineer is focused on. Um, and it, it, it's the most important role in every building has to stand up. Um, but it's not the most commonly known about. Um, nor is it the most paid. So in a, in, a, in a project like this, maybe probably less than 5%, maybe even like 1% of the money of the entire, of the entire project went to the structural engineer. Um, uh, but the office is smaller, and there's not as many people to pay, so it's not like, you know, you're not making any money. So engineers can make good money. But the idea is that the role that we play in terms of money is kind of small because materials cost a lot of money. Um, but in terms of importance, the engineer is very important. And that's why uh, everyone points the finger at engineers when something bad happens. Uh, they, they, that, there's a lot of liability there. That's why we need more special education and, and more specialized uh, licensing and certification is because the liability falls on the engineer if something bad happens. We're kind of like the goalie in soccer. Like, no one talks about us unless something bad happens. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, um, Alright, so, 
When forces act on a structure, we call them loads. And there's a few different types. So dead loads are things that don't move. You can write that down. They, they, uh, like, for example, the, the self-weight of the building itself. Um, so here, uh, just a bunch of steel that makes up the actual building. We call that a dead load because it's always in the same spot. The, the, the columns and the beams that you see here, they're never going to move. They're always there, so we know exactly where they are. We call them dead loads. Live loads are things that have more uncertainty and can move and come and go. Um, the reason why I put this here is because uh, I'm nostalgic about this show. And also, because what's behind, uh, what's behind Jim and over here? Do you remember? You guys all watch the show, right? I know. Okay. So uh, the conference room right now, is it empty or full? It's empty. What happens when they do all their conference room shenanigans? It's full. Right? So the engineer, engineers have to think about, you know, the, the, uh, the live load in that, uh, in that conference room is, is when everybody's in there. But then everybody could leave uh, and go somewhere else, right? Desks and things too. If they decide to pile all the desks in the conference room, right? There's things that engineers have to think about. Um, uh, and when, when loads come and go, um, they're called live loads. Uh, a certain type of live load is an environmental load like this tornado. This is, um, insurance companies call these things the acts of God, uh, right? They're things that, natural disasters, <coughs> things that, um, that just happen, that aren't loads that are part of just the building itself. Um, can you think of some other examples of environmental loads other than like tornadoes? <coughs> Tsunamis, earthquakes, good. Snow. Hurricanes, good. Snow, snow, also true, right? Snow, there's been times where you don't eat things snow. Oh, snow just like falls with water and melts. Actually, there, there's, uh, there's cases of buildings collapsing um, because of snow. Like, uh, uh, I remember hearing about like in Utah, there was some, something that was made for the Olympics that ended up collapsing. Um, some kind of Olympic stadium or something like that. The, all the snow oh, yeah, piled under the roof. Um, so, so these are dead loads, live loads, environmental loads. So, based on these loads, structural engineers determine the size, shape, and type of the components that pull structures together. This goes for buildings, bridges, dams, roller coasters, cars, airplanes, golf clubs, skateboards. I like to say another little quote here, anything that's not supposed to break needs a structural engineer. Right? So that's a lot of things. Pretty much nothing's supposed to break. So structural engineering applies to more than just buildings. Um, that's the buildings is probably the primary aspect. That's what we're going to focus on. But to give you an idea of just what structural engineers do, can be applied to a lot of different things. And yeah, there's there's people working for for uh, golf club companies and uh, you know like mountain bike companies trying to make that bike lighter and stronger at the same time, uh, so it can jump off higher cliffs and stuff and still and not, and not break. That's all structural engineering. All right, so capacity and demand. This is really important in terms of the mathematics and the logic in the way structural engineer, engineers think. So, capacity. Capacity is the maximum force that a component can sustain. Demand is the force of being applied to the component. So this is just a simple way of thinking about it. A safe design needs capacity to be greater than demand, or that ratio needs to be greater than one. This is the thought process that structural engineers use to make sure the structure will be safe. So um, the mathematics of structural engineering can get very complicated, but the lo this, is, this is the logic. This isn't so much, it's not like we use this, we use this equation, but obviously you can tell this equation is very simple. This is more of a, of a, of a thought process. Of, okay, what is the demand on, on a structural component? What is its capacity? That ratio needs to be greater than one or else it's not safe. Um, and in fact, that ratio is also called the factor of safety. So if the factor of safety is two, that means the capacity is twice as big as the demand. That gives you an idea of how, how safe you are, right? Okay, a couple of the real life examples just to, to get to the logic of capacity and demand. Before I eat, I want five hamburgers. After I eat, I ate one and I've got four left, left over. 
what did that what happened? My eyes were bigger than my stomach, or my demand was bigger than my capacity. Does that make sense? This yeah. I like that. this is a good sound. So this is my stomach. My right my my demand I thought I could eat five hamburgers, but my, my stomach, the capacity of my stomach was one. So I ate one, I got four left over, right? So in this case, um, this is five, this is one. So it wasn't a safe design. Um, yeah, I wasted money, definitely. So, all right, here's another example. So we've got a big dude, we've got a small dude, we got a big weight, we got a small weight. Which weight would you ask each person to carry? <laughs> if you like watching YouTube videos where people get hurt, you're probably going to give the big weight to the little guy. But if you're thinking, <coughs> you would give the big weight to the big guy and the small weight to the small guy if they had to carry them. Second question. This is where capacity and demand gets really important. If you had to hire each of these guys for, to work for you, who do you think would cost more per hour? The big guy. Big guy. Why? Because he can do more work. Right? He can get more things done for you in the same amount of time. So structural engineers, not only do we think about capacity and demand, but we think about when it's cost beneficial. Right? So if I have um, I think of an example, right? Like you guys are sitting on these chairs, and these chairs are not supposed to break when you sit on them. The, the demand. The demand is is the uh, is your weight that's sitting on the chair. The capacity is the maximum amount of weight that could be held on that chair at one time. But when someone was designing it, why didn't they design the capacity of that chair to be a thousand pounds? Because yeah, because it, it wouldn't be cost beneficial to do so. So as structural engineers, we design things. We make sure the capacity is greater than the demand but only to a certain extent that it's cost beneficial to do so. So we don't like to say be as cheap as possible. That's not a word that you want to tell the architect or the owner, I made your building cheap. You know, but least expensive and cost beneficial, those are words we think of. There's economics involved in structural engineering. It's okay, how do we need to make it safe? Priority one. Priority two, make it just enough safe that, uh, that cost is optimized. Um, what are some other examples of capacity and demand? Okay, in what way? Like supply and demand kind of thing. That's supply and demand. Also a good concept, but you're mixing the two. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, like a water bottle. You want it to be able to hold enough water. You don't want it to carry around like a 20 gallon tank to do it all that. It's a good topic. Any more? Black Teddy, give me one. Okay, and what is, uh, uh, on that note, right, it, yeah, cars have different capacities. Some cars seat two, some cars seat four, some cars seat eight, right? Um, and it all matches the function, right? Every structure has a function. Um, and so, depending on that function, it, it's, is, uh, that, that'll determine, uh, in de on the demand, depending on the, the function and the demand, that'll determine what capacity is, is optimal for your design. Um, what about this room? Right? You guys have every almost every room you go into, you see something that says normally near the door, it normally says like capacity, 45, stuff like that, right? Right? Who determined that? Who said that that was 45? Not yeah, it's a fire marshal. We'll say fire marshal, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Believe it or not, a lot of things that the farm fire marshal decides are to uh, uh, affect what the structural engineer does. You know, um, how they can make the room. Well, how many people can it fit? What does the fire marshal say? Actually, the 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 the, um, the the height of wood buildings is limited to the height of, of the ladder of, the, of of a fire truck. So you can't build a wood building higher than than the fire than the, than the, the ladder of the fire truck can go up because wood buildings are you know more critical uh, during fire. So believe it or not, actually things that fire marshals say and do and decide are important for structural engineering. Uh, but yeah, this this building this room has has a capacity of, uh, I don't know, maybe 45 people. And uh, right now, the demand is 20 or 25, so we're good. 
right? Capacity is larger than demand. Uh, structural examples would be like, like your chair that you're sitting on. Structural examples are any time you're talking about force. There's a demand. In structural engineering, the demand is a force. The capacity is the maximum force that that, can, that can, component can sustain. And I think you guys wrote that down, which is good. All right. We don't have time. We got so much time. You guys are going to have a lot of time to kill today. Um, I love time. We'll do, uh, we can do questions and stuff like that. So what did we learn? <laughs> Earthquakes are bad. <laughs> uh, but what did we learn? We got a lot of time, so, so I'm going to go around. And this is also how I learn your names. I try to, try to learn your names. So, so uh, tell me your name and tell me who you are. Uh, I'm Luke, and I learned about uh, fault lines. What specifically? What about fault lines? Well, I got to be like, Okay. Good. What's the subduction fault? It's when one side doesn't meet the other. What's, uh, what, you, I mentioned it briefly, you guys are writing down. That is the type that cause tsunamis. Oh, so, those are normally out in the ocean, and uh, subduction faults are normally the ones that cause tsunamis. Can you name one more time? Uh, Luke. 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 Thanks. Luke. Alright, let's go for another one. You like to talk to UCLA. What's your name? <laughs> Thomas. Thomas? Alright. Uh, I learned about a fault rupture, like points and there's a focus and there's that at the center on top of the focus. Thank you, Thomas. Very good. Alright. I'll call on people if you don't just raise your hand. So. Name? Uh, Alex. Alex. I learned about seismic waves and that there's two different kinds and that. The, the body ones are the ones on the surface. Yep. And then well, the, well, there's body and surface ones. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. And then the body ones, that, the S one is more dangerous. Good. Yeah. And I didn't show you videos, by the way. I, I told you four waves the P wave, the X wave, and then there's Love and Rayleigh. I didn't show you videos of those. So uh, actually, I have them somewhere in the Google Drive. I just, they didn't make it in the PowerPoint. Um, but yeah, P and S waves go through the body of the Earth. Uh, and the Love and Rayleigh waves um, are what are the ones that just travel on the surface. Um, good, Alex. Cool. Luke, Alex, Alex. Uh, I learned about the. Oh, my name is Caleb. Thank you. <laughs> I learned about the basic, the basin effect. How yeah. um, the soil conditions can affect the uh, amount of shaking, in especially in LA with the hard rock from way transitions from. Uh, more moist soil to hard rock, it'll bounce around and create more shaking. Okay. And specifically when that soft soil is surrounded by hard rock. Hard rock that's when it when it uh, goes back and forth. Uh, Mexico City is like that too. I think back in the 80s, there was a big earthquake that happened in Mexico City. And it happened like really far away from Mexico City. That's where the epicenter was. And it traveled really far. And all the cities were like fine. And then it got to Mexico City and giant construction happened. Mexico City was built on like an ancient Mayan lake or ancient Mayan or it'd be Mayan, not Aztec. Is it Aztec or Mayan? Aztec. 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 Probably Aztec. Aztec. I think it's Aztec, guys. I think it's Aztec. Okay, so maybe it's Mayan. I don't know. It was built on a big lake. So, so Mexico City was built on, on an old lake. So, so actually, the Spanish got there, and I think they like they wanted to. Uh, and well, the ancient civilization had put some stuff like there was like a small island or something in the middle of the lake. They had built there. Anyway, they like drained it out and made it a whole city. But uh, but then that's all soft, really soft soil, right? So um, so that's what happened. Um, and uh, that uh, that's another example of the basin effect, Caleb. <laughs> How about in the back? Is the water cooler? Yeah. What's your name? Uh, I'm Julia. Julia. Uh, hey, Julia. Uh, dead loads, there are things that like don't move in the structure. Good. And what about you? Paul, oh, Jeremy, I learned about liquefaction and how it can uh, cause people to sink in the loads. Not a good thing. No. Wait, can you hear me one more time? Jeremy. Jeremy. And that was Julia. Yeah. Two J's back in the back of the country. Who else? Someone help me out. Uh, How about someone at this table? Help me out over here, Dave.
Yeah, yeah it's Daniel. Did you say Isaac? Isaac. 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 Isaac.